Our next speaker, I haven't seen for some time prior to this evening, but I get in touch with him. He's a congressman, he's from Texas, and Texas next to California is the number two state as far as we at Coors are concerned. <laughs> but uh, Ron Paul has been a member of the Republican Party from Texas, and that's like not being too popular. You know, if you want to count numbers. It's like being a libertarian, if you will. It's like being in favor of reason and emotion from Texas. He consistently ranks first in the House in the ratings of both the National Taxpayers Union and the Council for a Competitive Economy. He's now serving his fourth term, and he's going to talk to us tonight in his allotted time, which is tough for a Texan, on the subject of the need for new ideas. Would you please welcome Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. I'm here from the government. I'm here to help you. <laughs> Believe that one. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> Certainly is nice to be here, and I, I really believe and feel strongly that it is indeed an honor for Bob to have called me and to invite me to speak to you. Because I, I'm just convinced it's a distinguished audience and it's a, a great event to celebrate 15 years of reason. Matter of fact, in the 60s, uh, it was an important decade for me. I finished medical school in the early 60s and it was as I was finishing medical school that I developed an interest in economics as well. And it was during the 60s that uh, I think Ann Rand had a lot of influence on uh, what I was thinking at the time. And I do recall that uh, I did receive the first subscription of Reason Magazine in 1968 and received every one since. And uh, therefore, as I was formulating my views during the late 60s and the early 70s as I was entering into politics, uh, I know definitely that uh, the magazine has had an influence and still does uh, influenced me a lot and my staff in Washington. So uh, it's, it's been a great magazine and uh, I hope sincerely it continues to uh, do the job it's been doing. I uh, understand, I saw some applause here earlier for, the, for anarchists and I want you to know that some of my best friends are anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you also to know that I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't be a politician, if I w wasn't a politician. I'm here because I'm a politician, because uh, Bob wouldn't have called me if he had just heard about me being a gynecologist delivering babies down in Texas. Now, Art Laffer might have called me because he might need a gynecologist. <laughs> but Bob wouldn't have called me. I'm here because I'm a politician, not because I'm a doctor. And it's been a vehicle for me, and uh, it's been something that has permitted me to participate and actually uh, qualify, so to speak, to come and meet with you. and. Uh, it's, since my pay is less as, in, as I'm being involved, when I'm involved in politics than it would be when I'm in medicine, uh, some of the rewards are the, uh, is the privilege of coming to uh, and, and meet with you. So I qualify mainly by being a, a politician and to me in some ways this is self-serving because I, I do enjoy uh, being involved and dealing with the issues of the day, uh, not, because, not only because I enjoy the discussion but also uh, because I'm concerned about what's happening. And uh, I think my uh, topic for the night is rather appropriate, the need for new ideas. How can you think of a better guy to talk, talk about need for new ideas, somebody who spends their time in Washington? I mean, it's, it's very obvious. <laughs> if you ever want to, see, Bob is more optimistic than I am. He was describing all these wonderful things happening in Washington, all this deregulation and this stuff going on. Some days I'm not that optimistic. I mean, I do think I get more optimistic when I come out here and visit real people. You know, when I come back to the United States, it's much better than when you're in Washington. <laughs> but I, I do believe there is certainly a grassroots uh, change occurring in the country today. It is not reflected and has not been reflected in Washington yet. And uh, who knows if it will or not, but I do know that the effort is worth, worth it. And uh, one way or the other, if we're determined, we can do something about it. How it's going to come about, I'm not so sure. Uh, I've decided we only have two problems in Washington, 
uh, made up of conservatives and liberals. The rest are okay. Uh, <laughs> But we, we, we certainly have problems there, and I thought I'd try to demonstrate a little bit uh, of what we're facing and the, and the reason we need some new ideas. I found a couple of bills I thought, I, brought, I thought I'd bring along with me to show you what's happening. And here's one uh, introduced uh, just recently by a fellow by the name of Weiss. Uh, he said that he would like, this is a, a bill, H.R. 414, to provide authority for the president to stabilize prices, wages, interest rates, and corporate dividends. <laughs> That's all he wants to do. <laughs> he wants to eliminate all windfall profits, in other words, necessary to carry out the purpose of this title, and to stabilize interest rates, corporate dividends, and similar transfer at levels consistent with orderly economic growth. It'll be, it'll be orderly, there won't be any. <laughs> And such orders and regulations may provide for the making of such adjustments as may be necessary to prevent gross inequities. No inequities. And uh, only a minor penalty. If you don't behave, you get fined $25,000. And if you don't pay, you go to jail. <laughs> so that's one sitting there just in case they run out of things to do. <laughs> this kind of stuff you think never could be possible. But the truth is, is, a lot of this is on the books already. You know, if you look at banking regulation number one and the Defense Production Act and all the other things sitting there, they re really want to take absolute control of the economy in your life. They can and they will in due time if we're not careful. Now here's another one, H.J. Res 202. Uh, this is by Mr. Owens. He says, proposing, an, oh, he has to amend the Constitution on this one. Propo serious stuff. Proposing an amendment to the Constitution which provides that the United States shall guarantee to each person the right to employment opportunity. Everybody gets a job, so don't sweat it. Don't worry if you're out of work. Tell us in Washington. We'll fix it up for you. You know, just last week, uh, the administration sent a bill down, introduced, uh, by somebody in the Senate, and uh, they, they've been annoyed. They haven't been able to send enough of your money to China. So they had to change the rules because somebody along the way made the rules that if you're a communist, you can't get the money quite as easy as if you're not a communist. It takes a little bit of finagling. They still get plenty, but you've got to do a little finagling. <laughs> and it slowed up the administration a bit. So what they're doing is we're going to declare, if we pass the law, that China is no longer communist. <laughs> This is the truth. This is unbelievable, but this is the truth. They said if it's no longer communist, then they qualify for XM loans and they get a low discount rate. The other day they came to me, the State Department came to me and they said, uh, we'd like to change your mind on the MX. We need your vote on the MX. It's a tight vote. And I said, well, um, I'm not all against this defense business, but uh, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me to, you know, build more weapons when we're still paying for theirs. I said, <laughs> I said, why don't we cut that out? <laughs> he really didn't, he didn't have too much answer for that, but then he got to think, he says, well, I'll tell you what, he says, that would be bad. And then I mentioned that about communist China. I says, what you're trying to do is, you know, change this with, with China. And he was very much aware of it. He says, he said, do you know that if you had your way, they'd be dancing in the streets in Moscow today because they would know that we were, we were going to desert our friends in China. He would just scare to death that if we don't send enough of your mind to China, then they might become friends with Russia. Well, he didn't get my vote. But <laughs> I understand I called my office this evening when I got in here and they said, well, uh, the Secretary of the Defense called me three times today. I guess there's a vote coming up on Tuesday, and it's a tight vote. But uh, I, I don't quite see a lot, any reason right now that we should uh, build weapons for both sides. I don't know how I'd feel any more secure. You know, I, I still can't understand this about the weapons. You know, uh, I wasn't for this nuclear freeze business. Uh, I'm just for voting for less money for uh, bombs, that's all. But I didn't like this idea of, uh, of, of signing, uh, signing a treaty because I don't trust the Soviets and I don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I don't, what I don't understand is how they feel so much more secure if you have 30,000 bombs, how do you get more secure with 40,000? 
You know, and that's the argument. And the other thing is, is if you have 30 or 40 or 50,000 and you freeze them, how do you feel more secure if you sign a treaty with a bunch of hoodlums? So, lo and behold, I was in the middle of that when I couldn't even find either side I was on in that debate. Here's another one. Uh, Monetary Control Act a few years ago was passed 1980, and uh, in the conference, this was never debated in the House or the Senate, but in the conference they stuck a little clause in there and said, well, if we run short of collateral for our Federal Reserve notes, use foreign bonds. They're pretty good. Mexican bonds, British bonds. <laughs> but you do it. They have it. It's legal, and they do it all the time. They, they thought they were going to sneak this through and that nobody would ever see it or hear it again and nobody would check on it. Well, I found it and we circulated this among newsletter writers and we have generated tens of thousands of letters to the Federal Reserve System who never gets any mail. <laughs> but they didn't feel good about all the mail they were getting. They were rather annoyed by it, so they decided they were going to change this. They came over and volunteered to have hearings to explain that that's not so. I was distorting it, and that's really not what was going on. We weren't using really foreign bonds to collateralize our money. What they said was happening was they were just trying to earn interest, and of course they've been giving me a little bit of trouble in, in uh, giving me the information I've been looking for. But they said we were going to revise that, and this week, lo and behold, uh, Mr. Fauntroy, who's the subcommittee chairman on domestic monetary policy subcommittee on which I serve, they have introduced this. When we called the office, we said, well, have you checked this out with the Fed to see if they approve this? And they say, what do you mean? They're the ones who wrote it. They admitted it. It says, to amend the Federal Reserve Act to provide flexibility in the issuance of Federal Reserve notes in order to assure that the nation will have an adequate supply of currency. Now, how do you think they're going to do that? And you know they're restrained now. They can't print them unless they have Mexican bonds. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of restraint there. <laughs> But now they're going to change the rules. Is my time up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting started. <laughs> this says that collateral shall not be required for the Federal Reserve notes. Now they're not even going to use any of that funny money to back up your funny money anymore. <laughs> but they're changing the rules all the time. But uh, if that doesn't convince you, I can tell you a few more. We're desperate. <laughs> We're desperate in Washington, the country is desperate. Desperate for new ideas. Desperate for the ideas uh, that have been presented in magazines like Reason for several years to be implemented. Yes, we see signs that they have been introduced. But what we have in Washington, really, you can't rest well at night. Don't be reassured that we're making much progress. I think in the educational sense, we have made progress. And I think at a grassroots level, we have. The real question in my mind is, do we have enough time? Do we have enough time, really, to change enough attitudes so that one day those who are in charge of the legislation in Washington will reflect those views? Today, that's not the case. Fortunately, though, more and more grant, uh, uh, people are joining the underground economy and keeping the economy alive. And <laughs> That, that won't work forever because that just gives the status more incentive. And that's why this administration has just hired 5,200 new IRS agents. And that's the problem because unless we resolve that conflict of the great desire for the real market to work, that is the black market, versus the individuals in Washington who think they must enhance revenues, and collect be more efficient tax collectors. This is also why there's a big attack right now, today, on the hard money assets. Mainly because you who know something about hard assets protect yourself and you're pointing the finger at the scoundrels. And you're saying you're the culprits who's destroying the money and we know what you're doing and we're going to preserve our country, we're going to preserve our freedom, we're going to preserve our own assets. So what are they going to do? They're going to attack it. That's why in the conference they put a little clause in there and excluded from the IRAs, you're not allowed to buy gold coins. And that's why they're preparing to make sure that if you invest in gold and silver or any collectible, that you won't have uh, capital gains uh, benefits. It's an attack on those individuals who know how to protect themselves because if you know how, you point the finger at the ones who are causing all the trouble. Those who are depreciating the currency, destroying the system, and destroying the country. 
It wasn't too long ago when we had our first budget resolution, 1981, one gentleman was asked, uh, you know, he had been lobbied by the administration to come in this way to vote with the administration, and he said he finally did. And the interviewer asked him, he said, how come, uh, how come you voted with the administration? He was one that was wavering back and forth. He says, well, he gave me the best deal. And the reporter said, well, you know, and I think he needed some guarantee that he'd get a subsidy uh, somehow or another that he needed for his district. He says he got the best deal from the Republicans, so he went with the Republican balanced budget, you know, only 47 billion off balance that turned out 115. And uh, they said, does that mean your vote can be bought? And the congressman said, no, but it can be rented. <laughs> Be reassured though, we have things under control in Washington because we had a very crucial vote yesterday. Very significant vote. Yesterday, we made sure that the temporary debt has now become permanent debt. Now I know you realize we were getting ready to pay that debt off and that's why it was always called temporary, but the permanent debt was always only 400 billion. But we had to raise the debt limit up a little yesterday. We had to boost another 100. 100 billion that is. We had already raised it 145 billion for this year. But they raised it and turned it into all permanent debt. It's 1.389 trillion now. But since the conservatives have been in charge, uh, we've been doing real well. We have only increased the national debt by 454 billion dollars, nearly a half a trillion dollars. Obligations, of course, are about 11 trillion. Can you imagine what would have happened if we'd have had the liberals in? I mean, we could have been in deep trouble. But the spending, we're getting control of it. We're really tightening down on it, but what we're doing, what we have expect to do is generate a lot of new money, stimulate the economy, and collect more taxes, and then the, the budget will be balanced. But don't hold your breath. It doesn't look like uh, that's going to happen. You know, sometimes I don't seem to fit in real well in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> So one day after I got back to Congress, I was in in 76 for a part term and I was reelected in, uh, in 78 and I went back and I introduced a couple bills like uh, reduce the salary of congressmen at the rate of inflation. Maybe they'll learn a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't go over too big. I got two co-sponsors. <laughs> but then I had one that said no junkets. No junkets. Y'all stay home. Y'all know what to do at home and vote without going over to Europe and Paris and all these places to study the issues. And uh, one fellow came in, had been in about 20 years, he sat down and he says, look Ron, he says, we're glad to have you back, but lay off. He says, a lot of us enjoy this. He says, y'all just learn to enjoy these side benefits because that's part of our pay. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that went by, but he came back six months or so later, and he sat down with me again, and he wanted to give me some fatherly advice, because I think we were looking at a vote, and it was 435 to 1, and, uh, and he, was, he was a little bit worried about that. He says, look, he said, you keep voting like that, and you're not going to come back again. He says, you're a weak politician, and he says, you've got to go with the mainstream if you want to get reelected. And he was serious. He wanted to give me this advice on how to, get, how to keep coming back. He said, I want to give you this advice. He says, in Washington, expediency is a virtue, consistency is a vice. And he said, uh, if you learn that lesson, you'll learn to come back another day. Well, something happened after that. He went home and lost his election. I went home and my opponent dropped out and I got 99% of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe truth wins out in the end. Now, I'll bet you any money I'm coming real close to having used up all my time. <laughs> and I'd like to just give you one little quote. I hope I got a message across that we have problems and that we need new ideas. I, that's what I was supposed to do. But I'd like to quote from Mises and say, and, and re recite this, there is no means by which anyone can evade his personal responsibility. Whoever neglects to examine to the best of his abilities all the problems involved voluntarily surrenders his birthright to a self-appointed elite of supermen. In such vital matters, blind reliance upon experts and uncritical acceptance of popular catchwords and prejudices is tantamount to the abandonment of self-determination and to yielding to other people's domination. That's what we have to do. We have to prevent that. And thank you very much. Thank you.